Um, good morning, everyone. I want to thank uh, Devin and Miguel for having me back. Uh, Devin is absolutely right. I have worked for water districts for about 20 years. My last job was at Harupa Community Services District, which I gleefully retired from. And now I'm just doing landscape classes and gardening and being a grandma and doing a little consulting. So I, I've completely redone this PowerPoint. If you've joined us for previous PowerPoints, it's gonna be a little bit different. And this one focuses entirely on plants. You're really fortunate it, at your water district in your city because Devin and Miguel are very passionate about this subject. They really put their money where their mouth is. They're preparing for a long time future. And as you saw, those regulations that are coming up are pretty, um, pretty stringent. And we all in Southern California have to be prepared for that. The largest water user we have in our own residence is landscape. So this hopefully will give you some ideas of ways to go and maybe save some water in your, and save some money too. So the one thing I wanted to show you, um, a water-wise landscape does not have to be ugly. This is not Arizona. We do not live and exist with only cactus. I have a very water-wise landscape and the picture of the rose that you saw, that you see on this, I just took that this morning and added it in. I myself love lots of color, lots of beautiful plants. That rose has been in only about a year. And after you have a plant in, a rose in, they're actually shockingly water wise. So I just wanted to share that beautiful picture with you this morning. I'm gonna turn my video off because it's always disconcerting to me to, to take a look at myself while I'm, uh, while I'm working. But um, so let's let's move on. This is our agenda for today. And I've done a couple of things that are a little bit different. We're going to go over why you should change, which I actually think Miguel covered pretty well. But there are some other reasons. Goodness gracious, I have helicopters overhead for some reason right now. Um, do you want to use natives or drought tolerant plants? There's always some special considerations. Uh, like children, animals, invasive species. And we'll lightly touch on maintenance and irrigation as we go through. And there's a couple of symbols which I'll explain as we go along. The picture, the plant I have pictured there is a California buckwheat. And if you're going to um, choose any one plant that is water wise and also helpful for the environment, a California buckwheat is that plant. At any one time, you can find approximately 90 different birds, bees, butterflies, or insects using this plant in some way, either for food, for a place to live. Um, it's a really critical plant in our habitat. And if you drive out in the mountains, you'll often see it wild quite a bit. As we go through our presentation, if you don't have a pad of paper with you, do, do get a piece of paper out. You might wanna take some notes on things that you particularly like. We're gonna go over a lot of plants and you'll get, you'll get lost in which one is which and which is best for you. So change, this sort of change is really hard for people to make. And it's not just the cost, it's kind of a psychological change as well. We're used to seeing very large expanses of grass. And grass um, is not native, obviously, to here. Grass came to California as people moved west. They, we immigrated originally um, to the East Coast. And as we moved west, we brought grass with us. So we just don't have enough water to sustain it for a long period of time. And when our population was small, it was a lot easier. So now we're stuck in this quandary where we have a very large population with the same water resources and we can't afford to keep grass as our primary plant. In the summer months in most, in fact, in all the water agencies I've worked in, which has been three throughout 20 years, 80% of summer water, 80% of the water that people at your water department either pump from the ground or bring from other places, treat and distribute to your house will be used for grass. 
This is what precipitates the change, but the change is hard. So you're gonna wanna start small and remember that a water-wise landscape can be beautiful. It's sustainable. It will not only save water, it will save you money. Water isn't getting any cheaper. It will require less maintenance long-term. It's a different type of maintenance. And it will also attract the birds, bees, butterflies that are native to this area. And that's important because we want our landscape to remain healthy. So we need the animals in it to have place, things to eat. They need water to drink. They need places to live. So this is, change is hard, but it can be done. Really knowledge is power in this instance. And the more you know, the better off you're gonna be. The one thing I would discourage you from is just hiring a landscape contractor and letting them do all the work and not having your own personal knowledge. The reason for that is because they're gonna leave your landscape once you're done and how it ends up doesn't matter to them. And that's not saying anything bad about landscapers. This is their business. But you have to live with your landscape for as long as you own your home or as long as you're in your apartment. So there are some resources available to you. And I, I didn't list this on here, but next time I'm going to. I've learned a lot through my own personal knowledge and everything that I'm going to share with you today is something I know personally. But I really stand on the backs of three women in particular that I have to acknowledge. And that would be my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt. They were all veteran gardeners. Um, and I had the good fortune that my mom lived with me for the last couple of years of her life. And she would you know, tell me what to do every single Saturday and Sunday in my yard. But I learned a lot from them and then built on that knowledge. So hopefully the knowledge I share with you today, some of it's from books. Some of it's from websites, but a lot of it comes from them and my own personal experience. And, and that's important to know. That's so important to know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my video on. I'm not gonna steer you the wrong way. If a, pro, a plant is a problem or there's a difficulty with a plant, I'm gonna tell you there's a difficulty with that plant because I don't want you to waste your money. This is critical. Most of us can't afford, including myself, to replant. Okay, we need the plant that is the right plant for the right thick place. And it's got to survive a long time because nobody ain't nobody got time for that. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. So that being said, these are some websites and some books and some gardens that you can use. I would really recommend you visually go and look at these gardens. You can do some of it online, but that is not going to give you the feel for the texture or the vibe of the garden. Chino Basin Water Conservation District has a beautiful resource for you there. It's free, it's in Montclair, and I understand that that's a little bit of a drive, but do it, it's worth it. Enjoy yourself, spend a day out. Nobody would spend a whole lot of money on their yard without um, resourcing or researching it a little bit on their own. The California Botanic Garden is located in Claremont, that you have to pay to get into. So Chino Basin is free. California Botanic Garden, you have to pay. There's a senior rate also, but it's still worth going, but it's a full day trip. And there's also a water conservation garden in Cal El Cajon. And you're gonna say to yourself, my goodness, I really have to travel far. Understand that you're kind of on the cutting edge of a big transformation here, where I think 20 years from now, uh, you will not see landscapes the way you see them now. We have large expanses of grass. You will see a lot more native and drought tolerant landscapes, but you're on the beginning of that. So you're not seeing it yet. There are a couple of books listed there. And then there are some websites. Probably the website I use the most is Las Politas. And they, it's a company that does a lot of native plants. You can actually buy plants from them too. It's a very, very good website. They obviously spent an enormous amount of time researching and then gone on their own, their, their own knowledge. And then look in your own neighborhood. What does well in your own neighborhood can be replicated in your own yard. Um, I'm gonna just give you an example of something terribly wrong. So I really wanted a particular type of plant called a manzanita. I really wanted it. 
And I talked to a couple of my gardening friends and they're like, yeah, you should be able to grow these. And they didn't live in my neighborhood. I'd never seen one in my neighborhood, but I persisted and planted them anyway. And guess what? They all died and they were expensive little die-offs. So look what's thriving in your own neighborhood as well. This is critical. I happen to live in Riverside. I know in San Bernardino, you face some extreme summer heat days like I do. The rose that I showed you in the beginning came through beautifully in those extreme summer heat days last summer. We had three days in a row of 117 degree heat. It killed the flowers, but the plant itself was fine, which is what I care about. In my own neighborhood, I knew this from seeing it in other, other people's yards. So look in your own neighborhood too. That's really important. Okay, why does it not want to advance? There we go. So you, you really want to start out with a goal. What are your goals? Or as my landscaper friend used to say, form follows function. Whatever, you, if, there has to be a function to your yard. And this is an important, if you're going to spend any time at all redoing your landscape, where you should spend the most time is thinking about what you want and what your goal is. Do you want a backyard that you can have your friends over and your family over? Do you want a backyard that's just to look at and just for yourself? Maybe you're kind of a solitary person. Do you want a backyard that you can eat in? Maybe you need a barbecue. Do you want to attract wildlife for your backyard? That was important to me. I wanted to attract birds and butterflies and bees to my backyard because I enjoy looking at that. And then other part of that, well, I got to go back. Do you want a cutting garden? Like I love that rose bush, but I cut them and bring them into my house. It's not just for outdoors. It's something that I can cut and bring. Do you, and your maintenance levels are important too. Do you want fruits and vegetables in your backyard? Do you want to grow food? I don't grow food because I quite honestly live alone with a little cat. I don't want to grow food. I, I don't need it. But a lot of people, this is really a source of enjoyment for them and it saves them money. So what is your goal? And you know, you can have multiple goals too. You can have, um, you can want to grow food and still want it to be beautiful. You can want a play area for your grandchildren or your children and still want it to attract wildlife. You can have multiple goals. And the last thing is always think about what you're trying to get rid of, what you want to screen out. Um, like the air conditioner at the top on the left or the trash cans. Always think about what's out there, right? What do you need to screen from view? That's important too. I'm fortunate my air conditioner's on the side of my house, but my garbage cans weren't. I need to find a place for my garbage cans because they're ugly. So, and I don't want them to detract from my own yard. So always think about your goals, even in plant selection. Weather and climate is probably the, the biggest, um, it's a big thing you need to think about. There's no sense in planting plants that are not gonna survive in your climate. We live in the sunset zones 18 and 19. Sunset zones are kind of an old school. There's a sunset book. Uh, if you're gonna use the sunset book and it shows you plants, we're zones 18 and 19. State of California also puts out climate zones, which were in climate zone 12. And the federal government also puts out climate zones. You can Google any of these, literally sunset zones 18 and 19, it's going to give you a list of plants. You need to, we're an interior climate. The ocean has almost no influence for us. Our summers are hot and our winters can get pretty cold. So you want to make sure that the plants you select are plants that can live with that extreme heat and sometimes occasional uh, freezing conditions. Not very often, but occasionally. We also have a very, very large area. I was really surprised to realize when I moved from Corona to Riverside, a 15 minute drive, the difference in my climate. 
Uh, it's much hotter where I live now. Corona had some influence from the ocean. Where I live now, there is almost no ocean influence, no winter fog, very, very little. So that made a difference in how I selected plants. So this is something to, to think about. You can still keep some grass. I don't ever want people to think that they have to get rid of all of their grass. I personally have no grass. That's because I'm a water conservation professional and they'll throw me out of the club if I have grass. But you can. And if I had small children or dogs, I probably would still have grass because dogs need grass, kids need grass. But reduce the amount of grass that you have to a manageable level. We'll be talking a little bit about plant factors later. Grass needs more water than any other plant you can plant, period. It, it needs so much water. In my area, just to survive in July, I need to apply, and we, we measure water, believe it or not, in inches for outdoor irrigation. I need to apply almost eight inches of water just to get it to survive, not even overwater it. So that's a tremendous amount of, of water. So you want to limit it to just a useful space, right? Where kids can play, dogs can play, or maybe you set up a patio chair. Make it the centerpiece. It is beautiful. I am never going to negate the fact that a large piece of green grass is stunning to look at, but make it the jewel in your crown, right? It, it can have a huge visual impact for you and make all the difference. So don't think at this presentation that you have to get rid of all your grass. That is not, that is not the direction we're going. In the future, um, I think you'll see less and less grass. I, you probably already noticed that. And that's because water resources are a little bit restricted due to increasing population and extreme droughts. So you're, you know, Southern California in particular is very drought prone. So but if you want to little, keep a little bit of grass, please do so. You cannot look at plants without thinking about color. You really need to think about how you react to color and what colors you like. Color has a significant impact on your mood and the, the look and feel of your garden. There, most of you will probably like what I call the hot colors, the reds, the yellows, the oranges, especially toward the outer edge of the color wheel. Cooler colors, which are the blues, the purples, the pinks, the softer colors, they're gonna be received, they're gonna recede, they're gonna give you a calming effect in your garden. Green is the beige, right? It's the neutral color and it's gonna provide the backdrop to everything else. No matter which colors you prefer, always add in some sort of plant that will bloom white. White makes everything else stand out. It makes every other color pop next to it. So you can either go with hot colors or cool colors. Green is your neutral white makes it stand out. What I would not advise you to do is to go with both hot and cool colors. If you think about it enough, you will come up with a color palette that you like, and then you wanna stick with that. So how does that affect us? Well, there's a color wheel, and the easiest garden to do is one with analogous colors, like you see on my color wheel to the left. See the black circles are throughout the, the blues, basically. Or you could have moved those up to the, the blues, purples, and pinks, or you could have done the yellows and oranges. In the center, I selected a picture by Vincent van Gogh, very famous picture. You've probably seen it, sunflowers. And everything in that picture is analogous. All those colors are in one section of the color wheel. And they do provide a very nice, almost calming effect to them. Vincent van Gogh was a master of color. And you're gonna see that again 
on this one. <coughs> this is another picture by Vincent, and he used complementary colors. These are the colors that are opposite on the color wheel. Either one will work, but there's a very different effect. You'll notice that the orange in his beard and his hair almost makes him pop out of that blue background. Well, that's not by accident, that's by design. His shirt, his background, everything kind of fades in and you only, you first see his face. It's not a particularly calm picture either when you look at it. So I'm gonna flip back. So here's the example of colors that are related on the color wheel, okay? And here's complementary colors that are exactly the opposite of each other on the color wheel. Uh, another way to think of this is Christmas colors, red and green. We use that a lot at the holidays. Um, they are exactly, they're complementary, but they, they work against each other in a beautiful, harmonious way. So give some thought when you're thinking about what you want to do in a garden to what colors you like, and then stick with that. Here's some examples of cooler garden colors, and they do recede and they do create a sense of calm. So you've got the purples, the blues, the lavenders, the softer pinks mixed in with whites. And in the top picture, you even have some grays in there. And the bottom picture, you have some whites, which make the other colors look good. I'm a relatively um, uh, hyper person. I'm, I'm a very busy little bee. And my yard is done entirely in cooler colors. That's because when I come home, I need to give myself a way to relax. I don't need to spin myself up. I need to relax. My mom was exactly the opposite. Her yard was entirely comprised of hot colors. That's what my mom liked and it's beautiful. These are the colors that have a lot of visual energy, okay? They, in the sun, they hold up really, really well. They're very vibrant. And you can see some examples of that in, on both, in both pictures. Again, the picture on the bottom also has some white that makes the other colors pop up. So these are the reds, the yellows, the oranges, the bright and shiny colors, even vibrant pinks will follow it, fall into hot colors. So when you're looking at color, try to think hot or cool. Now, if you wanna be like super lazy, the best way to do that is through monochromatic gardens. When you see the large country estates on TV, you see the big gardens in Europe, they've almost all followed a monochromatic scheme. And the reason that is it's much, much easier to do. You say, for example, I'm gonna plant white flowers, that's it. By the way, if you ever decide to do that, it's particularly beautiful at night. Um, they will be reflected in the moonlight. Those are often called moon gardens as well, but it's easy. If the picture on the right, is very inviting, it's very calming, it's very relaxing. It's also probably one of the easiest gardens you're ever gonna do because there's no selection process. Any white flower that might be drop tolerant, boom, there you go. On the left, I chose one that had um, cooler colors. It has some grays, it has greens, but it's purple. You have to really like the color you, you wanna choose, but if you're looking for something easy, you really cannot go wrong with this monochromatic, easy and elegant garden. All right, we already had Miguel and we're gonna take a five minute, and myself, this is the start. We're gonna take a five minute break. So actually it's 9.57. Um, let's come back at 10.05, grab some coffee, maybe a little snack, and we will be back at 10.05. Okay, we're back. Um, so we should, oh, yep, I'm unmuted. I just wanted to make sure. So uh, we're gonna move on to our next section. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I'm getting better at this Zoom business so I can manage the chat a little bit better too. And Devin will, Devin will help me out too. Devin, did you have anything you wanted to add right now? So I just wanted to let you know, and I know that we kind of spoke about it a little bit, um, and I think I'll probably pull up those slides later, 
but um, just uh, for our customers, be also aware that we do have those rebate programs that help you to incorporate some of these water saving materials like drought tolerant plants, like efficient irrigation, even uh, turf replacement materials such as mulch, gravel, decomposed granite, um, and, and other materials that are used in place of turf those are available to you and customers are eligible for up to $2,000 in water saving rebates if they are one of our customers. So just wanted to put that out there and let you know. If you have any questions about that, you can go ahead and put those in the chat or raise your hand and then we'll be taking questions later as well. That's great. Thank you. Thank you very much for bringing that up. Thank you. Um, those rebates that you have available, take advantage of them. I did where I live. And you have some really spectacular rebate possibilities within your district, within your city. So take advantage of those. It will make a huge difference in the cost of your projects. So with that being said, let's uh, move on to our next uh, section. So now we're going to talk um, spe about specific plants. And plants go, they, they fall into really two different categories, both drought tolerant or natives. Drought tolerant plants are from the areas around the Mediterranean Sea or Australia. Almost always plants are from those areas. A lot of them come from the Middle East or they come from Spain, France, anywhere that touches the Mediterranean area. And that's because in Southern California, we have a similar climate, not exactly the same, but similar. Drought tolerant plants really like drip irrigation. Um, they thrive on that and they bloom at different times. They don't know that they're here from another country. They don't know where they're living. And so if they're from Australia and they would normally bring uh, bloom in spring, for example, in Australia, Australia, their spring is our fall. So if you're looking for interest in your garden and you want something that's gonna bloom at a different time, a drought tolerant plant is good, either from the Middle East or from Australia. They may sleep in the winter, right? They, they are gonna go, every, everything sleeps sometimes. The only reason grass doesn't sleep is because we force it to stay awake. We give it a lot of fertilizer, we give it a lot of water, so it never has an opportunity to sleep, which creates other issues. But drought tolerant plants from Australia or the Mediterranean are gonna sleep in the winter months. That means they're gonna go dormant, all right? They're not gonna look their very best in the winter. Um, you have to fertilize them in the fall because for them, it's springtime. They think they're still in Australia or in the Middle East or around Europe. Now, natives are different. Natives have been here forever since before we were here for sure. And they're going to attract your local birds, bees, and butterflies. And I'm going to address all those subjects. They really don't care for drip irrigation. They really prefer overhead spray, just like the rain. You will have landscapers tell you that everything can be on drip. And that's just not true. That's not true. It can be on drip as long as you don't want your plant to live very long then it can be under it if you don't mind that you're gonna have a tremendous amount of die off in plants. But native plants do not like drip. They like what we naturally get, which is precipitation, rain or snow in the winter months here. Once they're established, native plants need no extra water, none. And I'm gonna show you some examples of that. And when I say none, I mean none, like, no, I look very thirsty. They just don't need any more water than what is provided by nature, even in some pretty bad drought years. You do not fertilize native plants ever. They are native, they do not need it. If you fertilize native plants, you will kill them. Um, they may sleep in the summer. Everything sleeps sometimes. They typically go dormant in the really hot months of summer. That's why it's nice to have a mix of drought tolerant plants and native plants because you always have something of interest in your yard. And um, I have highlighted native plants with the California poppy picture 
So when you were going through the rest of the plant portion of this PowerPoint, you're gonna see a lot of those little poppies. That means that is a native plant. I understand that this is a difficult concept, the difference between natives and drought tolerance, but it's, it's an important one to understand, mostly because you don't wanna keep replacing plants. When you get a plant put, you, you put up, you go to the trouble to buy a plant and then put it in and you nurture it and you're excited about it and then it dies. It's usually not the plant's fault. It's usually not even your fault. It's just that you've been told things that are incorrect. Again, I have a picture of a California buckwheat because this is the plant section. Um, the nice thing about the California buckwheat, by the way, is that in the fall, it turns red it turns, the flowers turn a very beautiful cinnamon red color and birds will continue to come and eat the seeds from this plant long, long after the white blooms fade and they fade to red. So it's a beautiful plant to have. It can get a little squirrely though, just telling you, it can get big. We have to remember about our fur friends. Um, I don't have a dog anymore. My last dog passed away, but I, I've always been a dog owner. And there are a lot of things that are poisonous in nature. And I'm just highlighting this because I would hate for your, your fur friends to get sick um, that are poisonous and for either cats or dogs. I've done some research on this. You need to be, I, I always suggest that before you put any plant in your yard, that you check the ASPCA's website for poisonous plants. You probably are minding your dogs anyway. They're probably not out there necessarily on their own, but do, do be mindful of that. Um, here are some common poisonous plants that, that quite, I knew about tomatoes. I did not know that sago palms were the number one poisonous plant for dogs, but you can see there's a huge list there. If you have horses, there are also poisonous plants for horses. Dogs tend to stay off plants. Horses will eat just anything green. So I would really, I want you to be mindful that we have to be careful for our, our little pets and make sure that they're healthy and not, not killing them off with our plant selections. And I did want to bring up a few other items here. And that would be pests, butterflies, birds, and bees. If you're using native plants, pests often control themselves. So you'll get a pest on a plant, but the, the natural predator to that pest will come and take care of it. I noticed that I've had a few aphids in my, in my yard. Um, all of a sudden I had a swarm of ladybugs and the aphids were gone. All of that being said, um, I'm not one of those people who is against using insecticides. If you need to use an insecticide, again, make sure that your pets can't get to it but by all means, use it. There are some very good all-purpose insecticides that are available at your big box stores at reasonable prices. There are also what's called systemic insecticides. That means that you put them into the ground, you dig them into the soil around the root base, and as you water, those plants in, absorb it, and that gets rid of the, and it protects it for a much longer period of time. That happens to be what I use on my roses is a systemic. It also feeds them at the same time. So I am not one of those people who will tell you do not use insecticides. There are some very effective natural insecticides. Um, if you put soap and water in a spray container and you use uh, very light soap, by the way, and you spray your flowers, it will often get rid of any insects that you have. Insects don't like or they don't like soap, but that does require a lot more time. I have a very large landscape, so I need to do what is most time effective for me, but that does work as well. So butterflies and birds are rarely a problem to people. Most of us love those two things. The butterfly that you see in the top, that's a monarch butterfly. And if you plant certain materials that you're gonna see in this presentation, you will definitely get butterflies for sure. And most of us love that. Birds as well. That The bird there is a Western bluebird. And I've actually attracted several of them to my yard. They're relatively rare. That happens to be a male. The female is a little bit less colorful. 
Anything you can do to attract birds and butterflies to your yard, we need them desperately. Okay, they do a lot of propagation for us. Most natives will attract both butterflies and birds. But there are some of you out there who are not a fan of bees. Personally, bees don't bother me. I'm going to notate anything in my presentation that I personally know to attract a lot of bees. If you have an allergy, it can be a real hazard for you. I've done a little bee research. There are about 1,600 native California bees, and the majority of those do not have stingers. And they look an awful lot like the bee in the bottom picture. They don't look like our traditional bumblebee, which is really a European bee. Native bees also don't make honey, and they don't primarily use hives. They're very, very solitary animals, and they nest in the ground. We really need bees to propagate plants. It's the same thing with birds. We need them to come and spread pollen around. So a lot of plants that are natives do attract quite a few, but I'll, I'll point them out for you in case you're bothered by them. I am personally not bothered by them. I enjoy seeing them, but, and I've never had a problem with them, but I want you to be aware for those of you who really do not want to attract bees. So you'll see a little bee symbol or a little native plant symbol as we go through. Birds, nobody minds birds. The next thing I want you to be aware of are invasive plants. Stay away from these. Like just don't buy an invasive plant. They destroy the habitat for every other plant. And some of them are super common. There's ice plant, pompous grass, tree of heaven you see, big periwinkle, which is what's at the top. We also call that vinca. Um, don't plant invasive plants. There's plenty of stunningly beautiful native or drought tolerant plants that will not ruin the environment. So just be aware. Most of these are not even sold um, very much, but you will see the plant on the top sold. There's a lot of other plants that you can have. So try to stay away from invasives whenever possible. I'm not showing you any invasives. There are some native plants that are invasive in a different way in that they take over whatever you plant them next to. And I don't plant those either because I don't want to spend my time drag pulling stuff out. So be aware of size when you're planting. How big are they going to get? So we're going to go right into trees. Trees were a weak area for me. Nothing makes more of an impact than a tree. And in each category, we're going to go over a few plants that I know a lot about and that are particularly beautiful in a yard, depending. And I'm gonna start at the top right. If you have room for an oak, plant an oak. There's a lot of different species of California oaks. I happen to give you a picture of one that is spectacularly huge and beautiful in a field. But in my neighborhood where I live, many, many people have oak trees that are 75, 100 years old. They are very stable. They are adapted to our environment. Rarely do you have an oak tree go down that has been properly rooted or that is old. They provide a lot of cover and food for birds. Um, they, of course, were used by Native Americans for thousands of years. But their bird, their willingness to provide a habitat for birds makes them worthwhile all on their own. I planted some um, in my backyard. I don't have that big a space, obviously. I can't put a California live oak. I'm also 60 years old and I would like to see like my tree get big and oaks are a medium growing plant. So I don't have enough time for that. But I planted a smaller, more diminutive version of an oak and it's doing quite nicely. It will provide some shade and some cover. It will never be as spectacular as the tree you see in the picture, but I just wanted to give a, a shout out to the California oak, if you can, do. The other plant that you see in the bottom, let's see, there, oh, sorry. I mean, I, oops, went too far. I've got to move something here because it's moving my, it's making it difficult. There we go. So that is a desert willow. And it is native to Arizona, but it will adapt and do well here. The great things that about plants that are native to Arizona 
is that you almost, even if they're not natives, never have to water them because they're accustomed to even less water than we get here. That's why when you look at a Las Vegas type yard or you look at a Phoenix type yard, those yards don't do well here because we get too much rain on a normal year for those plants to survive. A desert willow has a beautiful canopy. As you can see, there are varieties that have yellow flowers, not just pink flowers, but it is a spectacular shade tree. They do not take very long to get to a, a nice size and they are not a gigantic tree. Their roots are not gonna ruin everything that you have, which is an important consideration. A California oak has a huge oak root system. A desert willow does not. A great myrtle offers interest in more than one way. For one thing, their trunks are very beautiful. And when we do get rain, the trunk really gets quite even more beautiful. These grow as the lollipop tree that you see here with a single stem and then the larger flowers on the top, but they also grow in a multi-trunked shrub type variety. Um, a crepe myrtle comes in so many different colors that everyone can find a color to suit their needs. This is a particularly beautiful one. There's also one called a black diamond that is ruby red, but they come in pastel colors as well. They are all over my neighborhood, all over San Bernardino. They are not native to here, they're, they're native to the South, but they have adapted here and they do very well here. A word to the wise on all trees, don't ever top your trees. Nothing will kill a tree faster than topping it, cutting off the top of the tree. When I moved into my house, I had a beautiful, beautiful black walnut in the backyard that somebody talked it about 40 years ago. I live in the old house. And it took it about another 30 years to die, but I finally had to take it down because topping it will kill it. So don't, don't top your trees. Prune them, but don't top them. So here's trees part two. One of my favorite trees is a Palo Verde. I am from Phoenix. I love, uh, I love Palo Verde trees, but they are adaptable here. So in your yard, find the worst soil you have, the rockiest, the one that will hold the least amount of water, just do bad, bad soil and plant a Palo Verde tree. They also bloom in yellow and pink, but they have an incredible canopy that provides wonderful dappled shade that you can put chairs underneath. They are not slow growing and they have that beautiful multi-trunked branching habit, as you can see in that illustration. They're almost like a huge, huge shrub, but a Palo Verde tree with its green bark, beautiful light green leaves, really needles and flowers twice a year can be a spectacular addition to your yard. The, Calif the Catalina cherry is the tree on the right, and it is native to the Catalina, Catalina Island, which is part of the Channel Islands. It is not a particularly big tree. It is maybe 12 to 15 feet tall, but it does provide a cherry. It is a beautiful multi-trunk tree. It is native. Once established, it will do quite well on very little water. It'll, if you have a normal rain year, it'll be quite happy. The strawberry tree on the left is my favorite tree. And I have three of these in my yard. I love it because the name is confusing. It's called a strawberry tree because the fruit on the strawberry tree looks like a strawberry a little bit, but it tastes like guava. And it has beautiful flowers. The flowers and the fruit often are on the tree at the same time. Birds love it, even though it's not native, they seem to know what to do with that fruit. I eat a little bit of it, but I leave a lot of it for the birds. It comes in two varieties. What you're seeing there is the multi-trunked variety where it will, it almost grows as a, a gigantic shrub. And when I say gigantic, 10 feet tall, not really terribly tall. It's a great screener. Um, in my house, I use it to screen a window. My bedroom window happens to front on the street. 
And I like to leave my window, open, my curtains open to get some sunshine, but I don't want people to be able to see in my bedroom. So I have a strawberry tree planted in front of it. And that strawberry tree is trimmed so that you can't see in my bedroom, but I can get some sunlight in there. I can see through the tree and it's not right up against the window, but it's a wonderful screening for something particularly ugly. So a strawberry tree is a great addition. It's either a single trunk variety or a multi-trunk variety. You probably won't even have to look that hard for it. It's also called a madrilino because it is the, um, it is the state tree of Spain. It is all over Madrid. We have very much the same climate as Madrid and that's why that tree does so well here. Spectacular tree. So please consider it in your own landscape. So I, I have something, you know, a little bit on vines here, but I have to start you off on the vine talk. Do not plant any vine um, that is, an, uh, I guess, a natural climber. You always want to put a trellis behind a vine. The reason for that is a vine will ruin anything that it is climbing on. So if you have it on your house, it's going to ruin your house. Eventually, that vine is going to find a little nook or cranny and it's going to burrow its way into your house. My mom neglected a vine at her house and I went to visit her and no joke, the vine was growing through the wall. I'm like, mom, um, at that point, she was pretty elderly and she didn't notice, but it caused a lot of damage. So and be, be judicious about your vines that you grow because you don't want them to ruin your structures. So let's talk about um, these particular vines that I've selected. This time I'm gonna start on the bottom, the honeysuckle. Honeysuckle is an extremely invasive, wonderful smelling vine that is not native to this area. However, if you want to hold up a, a slope, there is nothing better than honeysuckle. Do not plant anything else with a honeysuckle. As good as it smells and as beautiful as it is, it will kill everything else. But if you have a slope, it is fantastic to hold up a slope. I mean, nothing will come down off that slope. Honeysuckle is great for that. Do not plant it on your house because as much as it will hold up the slope, it will also uh, burrow into your house unless you have it on a trellis that's about three or four inches off, you know, off your, your, your space and you're gonna maintain it. Then we have bougainvillea on the left bottom. Bougainvillea is from the Mediterranean. It is basically bulletproof unless it freezes for more than one day in a row. Then it's gonna die back. You're gonna to have to cut it back and it's gonna spring back almost always. When I say bulletproof, you literally could walk by it once a year and spit on it and that's enough water. It just, the more, the less water it gets, the more it blooms. The blooms are not really flowers. What you're seeing are leaves that are changing color. Doesn't matter, it's the same effect. Very little green on this. It comes in a big variety of colors, so you can find a color to match your palette. I particularly like this beautiful red one. It grows everywhere we see it. It does have thorns, so you must be aware of that. It's also highly trainable. So if you wanna take it over an archway, it's gonna grow over an archway. But you do have to be careful of the thorns. For the, for the reason of the thorns, it makes it a great impediment to people. Uh, in my house, it's easy. Uh, my fences aren't that high. Growing a bougainvillea on a fence pretty much assures that no burglar is going to come over my fence because they're not going to get through those thorns. No way. Sweet pea smells good and looks good. Okay, and it's a you might need to help it go up a trellis a little bit. It's not like a bougainvillea or a honeysuckle, which will find their own way but it is a spectacular vine within a specific plant palette. Birds, birds just love it. And of course it is a California native. On the far, on the top right is a California wild grape. And this particular variety is a Rogers red. That is 
the Rogers Red in my side yard. That is my, my plant. I planted that. It's on a trellis, by the way. You can't see the trellis, but it's on, the tre on a trellis. Um, I planted that. It was the size of a coffee cup about seven years ago, literally a coffee cup, because the smaller you buy a plant, the less expensive it is. And here it is, um, eight years later, barely controllable. I am training it to cover that block wall fence because the block wall fence is so ugly. And I'm doing that by there's some, I got some little sucky things that I put on the concrete and then I tie it up because it is a natural climber, but I want it to climb in a very specific way. It does have grapes on it. And if you look carefully at the picture, you'll see little things hanging. Those are grapes. It is covered with grapes, the bird, and they're not the beautiful ones like you get from the grocery store. They're tiny little purple grapes. They're edible. The birds eat them, I eat them, my kids eat them. They're good, but it's covered. On the very far right, you see an inset of red leaves. This plant is deciduous, meaning it loses its leaves in the, in the winter. And so I'm left with a beautiful grape vine. But before it does that, it turns that color of red. It's a wonderful plant to give you some autumn feel. And it's actually, this is after I cut it back. It was much, much bigger. So you have a lot of, a lot of great things about this plant. It's a beautiful vine. It, um, it turns red in the fall. It's great for local birds. It gives you fruit. But the best thing about this plant is I have never watered it since the day I planted it about seven years ago. And when I say never watered it, I mean never watered it. Like I've never, I don't do anything to it. And it still just gives me this beautiful, beautiful um, foliage. That happens to be on the side of my driveway. When I drive in, there's this beautiful vine. So if you've never had considered a California wild grape, I would really, um, I would really hope that you do consider it. It's because it's no water, it makes it much easier for me. I don't have irrigation in that bed. So everything in that bed has to grow with no water. Oh goodness, we just had a break. Let's, uh, it's only 1030. So let's go on till 11 o'clock. And then I was not sure how our timing was gonna work today. So let's, let's move on. Too soon for another break. We'll get one at 11 o'clock. I'll watch my clock. So let's, let's talk about large shrubs. Um, by the way, if you have any questions, please make sure you let Devin know. Uh, there's so many different shrubs that you can grow that it's almost overwhelming for people. And once you narrow down a plant palette, that's a way to narrow down what you might want to grow. We talked briefly about roses. Almost any rose that is heat resistant will grow in the Inland Empire. They like it hot, but some are definitely more heat resistant than others. The good thing about growing roses in, in the Inland Empire is because it's not damp or humid, a lot of the diseases that you get on roses like black spot, don't happen very often on roses that we plant out here. It's just not damp enough. And they will be prolific uh, bloomers. They are more work because you're gonna need to fertilize them. You might have to use insecticides on them, but you can grow them in vine form. You can grow them in shrub form. You can grow them in ground cover form. I have not found any roses that did not do well in the Inland Empire unless they are not heat resistant. When you go to a big box nursery or you look at a rose catalog, they will tell you if they're heat resistant. If you're at a big box nursery and they have roses there, more than likely they are heat resistant. That is our biggest problem. So I highly encourage you to find a rose that you like, if you like roses, and plant them. You don't need to only have natives. You don't need to only have traditional drought-tolerant plants. Once established, roses are shockingly drought-tolerant. We rank plants on a scale of 1 to 10. 
one being the most drought tolerant and 10 being the least drought tolerant. Kentucky bluegrass is an example of a plant that would be a nine, for example. It's not drought tolerant at all. But a rose actually, an established rose is about a four or a five. A cactus is a three. So they're not that much different. The reason is roses have a very long taproot and they will look for water. That taproot will go three, four, five feet down in the ground to look for water and feed the rose. So as long as you are aware of that and you look for heat resistant varieties, you should be just fine getting roses. And I would encourage you to do that. It adds a lot to a garden. The next plant, the long plant is a Cleveland sage. And it is a spectacular large shrub, and this is the flower on it. It does come in other colors, um, including a very deep, almost maroon red. This is the na most native of the colors. And when we say Cleveland sage, it's because it comes from Cleveland National Forest right here in our area. Birds love this plant. Um, it has a beautiful purple flower. Long after the flower is gone, there are seeds available for the birds to come eat. The big caveat to this plant is that it gets, it's gonna get big. When you read those plant tags, wherever you purchase your plants, and it tells you the plant is gonna be two feet by two feet or three feet by three feet, make sure you plant your plant in a place where it has at least that much room to grow. My experience has been with these is that they're not growing four by four, like, like it says on the tag. I have some that are truly six feet wide by six feet tall. They have become mutants. They are huge. Now you can cut them back, but if you've not got them crowded next to a lot of other plants, it's gonna be a lot easier for you to maintain your yard. You can just let them grow. You're gonna to need to only trim them when they've gone crazy, when you wanna shake them, but otherwise they really need no maintenance. They are another plant that once they're established, they need no water. They will just simply come back year after year. The sugar bush on the right is a shrub that will grow to eight feet tall by about seven feet wide. And the Native Americans used to use the flowers and the leaves and boil them and make tea. I don't know exactly how you do that, but it's sweet. And that's why they're called a sugar bush. They are exceptionally fire resistant. After we had those terrible fires in the center of our state last summer, after those fires went through, pretty much the only thing standing was California oaks and sugar bushes. Everything else was gone. Their fire, their fire resistance is incredible. And if you live in a fire prone area, it might be something that you consider using. They're also a beautiful plant. They will stay within a nice shape. They have a lovely flower, birds like them, of course, but it's something that you should, you should consider. Monkey flower is on the lower right and it comes in a very um, large variety of colors. It comes in purple, it comes in uh, pink, it comes in red, it comes in yellow, it comes in orange. It's a wonderful plant. In the Inland Empire, you want to make it shaded. It's only going to grow to about three feet tall. Tuck it under something where it is not in blazing sun all day long, every day. That is different from the roses, the Cleveland sage, and the sugar bush. You can plant them in, in the middle of your yard where they have no shade and they can be beat to death by sun all day long, every summer, and they'll be okay. Monkey flower will not. Monkey flower needs some, some afternoon shade. So if you have a space, maybe next to a building um, or underneath another plant, a tree perhaps, where it gets a little bit of shade, it will do well. But I have personally experienced monkey flower dying from too much heat. The last plant on this is the Mejia poppy. And you will hear this called um, the fried eggplant. It looks this good a large part of the year. And it, the flowers will be five to six inches across. So it is a big, 
showy plant. It is very attractive to birds, very attractive to butterflies. It is also going to grow very large. If you need to cover a lot of space, and in my yard, I did need to cover a lot of space, they'll tell you that this plant's gonna go three to four, you know, three to four feet. No, 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 no. In the right conditions, this plant is gonna grow maybe six feet tall by six feet wide. And then maybe once a year or every couple of years, you decide that you want to uh, trim it and you over trim it. Let's say I'm a bad trimmer. Say you just almost mow it to the ground, it will come back. It will come back to its same, uh, its same beautiful large shape. You almost cannot over trim it. You won't need to very often. That's something that um, I want to bring up in this point. Maintenance is always an issue for all of us, right? None of us want to do a lot of maintenance. I've never met anybody who said, "Yes, I want to maintain my yard every single day." On this slide, the roses need the most maintenance. They need feeding, they need deadheading where you cut off the spent blooms. Um, they might need insecticide wash. The rest of these plants need very, very little maintenance. You really would only trim them back. Well, you're not ever gonna fertilize them and you would only trim them back when they're out of hand. If you like the way they look, just don't trim them back, just let them go. And in my case, that often equates to about every three or four years. Now I have a bigger, a bigger landscape and I do have other plants. So it's not that I never do maintenance, but I don't do maintenance on these types of plants because they just don't need it. So that's something to consider when you're, when you're planning your own landscape. Shrubs are the backbone of any yard. And you will notice here that I apparently only like flowering shrubs. Almost all plants flower at some point of the year. But I did look up in my own yard and went, oh goodness, everything's flowering all the time. And I enjoy that, but some of you want, might want a little bit more muted um, palette. So starting again with the butterfly bush, that's the black knight variety there. They also come in a large variety of colors they look this good in spring through into fall they look this good they are not native so you're going to need to deadhead them a little bit and that means that if you want them to look this good you're going to have to go out maybe once a week once every two weeks and cut off the blooms that are gone that they're already past their prime and that will keep it flowering you're also going to need to fertilize it and i have five of these in my yard because I like to attract butterflies. They attract butterflies at a certain stage of their life. If you really want to have a butterfly garden, you need to plant some milkweed, which I have in, uh, I have a little bit of in my own yard because that provides food for caterpillars. You need to provide for the butterfly throughout its whole life. But once they become a butterfly, they're out of their chrysalis, they will come to the butterfly bushes that you have in your yard like crazy. I think they're worthwhile having, but again, they're not native. You can get them in pinks, purples, blues, whites, and butterflies like them all. I just think the Black Knight variety is a particularly beautiful plant. They will get large. They will get, even the dwarf varieties will get at least six feet tall by about five feet wide. When I say they're going to get large, it doesn't mean you can't trim them back to a size that you like, but I don't have a lot of time for trimming. So I usually plant things and just let them get as big as they want and trim them when they go too far. Silver lupine will grow in a shaded area. It attracts lots and lots of hummingbirds. Um, it's worth it just for that alone to attract that. It is, but it is only this color. It's going to grow about four feet tall. It's a variety of penstemon, which means it's always going to attract um, hummingbirds at certain points. It's also a nice cut flower and it is dated, but in the Inland Empire, it's going to need a little bit of shade. There's the coffee berry shrub. 
Um, it is not, a, you, you're not going to be making coffee off it, but it does produce berries that will look a lot like coffee. It has a beautiful flower, as you can see there, beautiful leaf texture. Much of the bar or much of the stems are red. It is a, just a beautiful backdrop plant. It is also a beautiful screening plant. You can trim it to, to, for shape. And if you want a hedge, it will also do really well that way. The California lilac on the bottom um, actually is from my yard and the picture truly does not do it justice. I that that plant is now a full six feet tall by about seven feet wide. And you're seeing it just as it's beginning to bloom with those bright blue purple flowers. But this is a bee plant. Bees love this plant. Uh, I go up because I'm always interested in the, what's going on on the plant. I'll stand right up on it. And the bees are not interested in me at all. They're interested in eating up the California lilac. Um, a word to the wise, there are many varieties of California lilac. There are California lilacs that grow low to the ground. There are ones that grow tall like this one. There are ones that grow in between. There are a wide variety of colors from pinks to whites to purples to blues. Most of the natural colors, they all attract bees. They all cannot be watered at all in the summer. I have never watered this plant. It is, I do have irrigation. You're looking at my front yard. This plant is not hooked up to irrigation. I've never watered it since I planted it about six years ago. It again was the size of a coffee cup. Um, and it has just, I watered it when I first planted it and just let it go. And the, I made the mistake. I had more California lilacs in my yard. And one summer, about three years in, they, it was so hot. And I thought I'm going to water it and I'm going to water these ones on the, on the opposite side. And I did water them and they were all dead within a week. So when I say no water in the summer, like you really have to hold to that because it will kill them. So the beautiful, beautiful plant, uh, wonderful for the environment. But if you do not want bees in your yard, do not plant any variety of California lilac at all. Uh, it will, it will not do it will not do good for you. So this is a toyon, and this is a toyon that's been allowed to grow into a tree, but it's, or a very, very large shrub. If you're looking to cover some large space, toyon may be your plant. It's very hardy. It needs no summer water. It has the beautiful red flowers on it. There are several in my neighborhood. It is really spectacular and a, to a toyon is just not a bad way to go. So if you're looking for something big and bushy and a shrub, I mean, some of these shrubs are big and some of them aren't. A butterfly bush is not that, not that large a plant. California lilac, I'm waiting to see how big that's gonna get. But the toyon will truly get large. You could use it to screen a very large area. So now we're going to talk just a little bit about smaller plants. Um, I classify things in my mind between trees, large shrubs, smaller plants, ground covers, vines, and I'm hoping that you find that to be worthwhile for you. These are all things that I've used in my yard just like all others. So starting with the coyote bush, it is a California native. You see this a lot in commercial applications. It does get a flower, but it, it doesn't flower most of the year. And it is a small leafed, very, very drought tolerant ground cover or small plant. If you have an area that you're having trouble with a plant, and you just need something low to the ground that you can hedge because they take hedging well, like you just want to mow over it and keep it a shape, a coyote bush is probably your plant. They need, they will tolerate, let's say that you have a drip irrigation system and you can't isolate a native off it. You can't. A coyote bush will tolerate some drip irrigation in the summer, whereas a California lilac will not tolerate it at all, ever. A coyote bush is a lot more forgiving. 
So if you need some ground green shrubs that you can hedge or mold to what you need, a coyote bush is a really good choice. And that's why you see it in commercial applications so much. Plants in commercial applications basically have to be bomb proof because they're being managed by landscapers who are managing so many other things. They may not give them the time and attention a residential homeowner does. So coyote bush is a good choice there. Penstemon. Penstemon comes in a very large variety of colors and shapes. Now, when I say shapes, I mean heights and bushiness. The flowers themselves are always that same tubular shape that you see in there. That happens to be a red penstemon. They're that tubular shape. Hummingbirds come to that plant, but so do bees. Bees will climb right into that tube to get the pollen at the end of that tube. So if you do not want bees in your yard, don't plant a penstemon. That being said, they can tolerate, all penstemon can tolerate a fair amount of sun, but you, they cannot tolerate the Inland Empire's full all day long, 12 hour day sun. I have penstemon in my yard. They are put in places that don't get beat to death all day long. They can tolerate a lot, but not all day. Cleveland sage, a few ones back, you can beat it. To, I use it to shade other plants because it can tolerate the heat and never even falter. Penstemon is not one of those. So, but penstemon is a spectacular plant and the leaves are also really beautiful. The plant itself is quite lovely, not just the flowers. Yarrow is one of those plants I think that every yard needs some. Every yard should have yarrow. I have yarrow as a border and I have the white variety. White and yellow are the native varieties. They've been hybridized to include some pastels. I also have some of the pastels. The yellow is extremely hardy. And the best thing about yarrow is look at the leaf texture. I love the flowers, but the leaf texture is very much like a fern. So if you're looking to have a little bit more tropical feel in your yard, a yarrow may be the plant for you. They're extremely hardy. They are very tolerant to heat. And they have a flat surface on their, on their flower that you can see. And that's where butterflies land. They will land on that flat flower and they will both rest and eat. And it is not unusual to go out and find one plant with several butterflies resting on the flower itself. That's, a, it's a great butterfly attractor. I have, as I said, growing as a hedge. I have white growing as a hedge. I have pink and pastels throughout the rest of my yard and some yellow as well. They don't grow particularly tall. The plant itself grows about a foot tall. The flowers may sprout out, depending on the variety, another six to 12 inches, but they are pretty. You can cut them, you can bring them in. You can also mow them almost like a lawn. If you set them at about your lawnmower at about four inches, Instead of ham trimming them, you decide they're a little out of hand, you can just mow them. They will spread on their own as well. They'll spread underground. They'll spread wherever there is water. So when I started my hedge, I didn't have the money to, to do a really thick hedge. So what I did is I spaced them out about 18 inches apart and then watered in between. And sure enough, within a year, they had followed the water and filled in. And that's just an easy hack to make it a little bit less expensive for you. They're a native. Uh, the Native Americans use them for medicinal purposes. Um, at the bottom, you have coral bells. I have tried this numerous times in my own yard. And uh, the only successful place I had was with a little bit of shade. They, this picture has them planted in full sun. That would be fine along the coast. It will not work in the Inland Empire. They are wonderful planted in a mass like that. They will propagate on their own. If you plant two or three, you'll be surprised how quickly they will become a mass of plants. They put out a lovely little, there are some white varieties, shoots of plants that are just stunning to look at. But in the Inland Empire, you definitely want to plant them 
where they get they're not in sun all day long. The kangaroo paw is one of my favorite plants. It is obviously not a native, it is from Australia. And if you look at the flower, it looks like a little kangaroo paw. It comes in orange, it comes in all the hot colors, orange, yellow, red, and it makes a, a spectacular cut flower. The ferny foliage at the bottom stays that nice looking basically all year round. And in the fall, it will put up these really beautiful flowers. They kind of look space age to me. Uh, the flowers will stay on the plant a full four or five months. They'll look that good for a really long time. But if you cut them and bring them in the house, they will look that good in your house for a really long time too. They come in both dwarf and standard varieties. Dwarf is about 18 inches tall. The standard size is literally three feet tall. If you have space and if you like hot colors, definitely add some kangaroo paw. Very, very easy to grow and adds a lot of interest to your yard. The California sunflower is a native flower. It is almost a ground cover, but not quite. It'll grow tall, but it'll also grow wide. So it's gonna, it's gonna cover up some ground, but it's gonna not be like a ground cover hugging the ground. It is of course our native sunflower, um, birds, bees, butterflies, everything like it, but it is not particularly attractive to bees, which is why I didn't highlight it like the California lilac. It only comes in this color because it is a native plant. It's never been hybridized. It can be a little rangy looking, where it just gets a little spindly. However, if you trim it back occasionally, you can avoid that. I would plant it in the worst spot in my yard because it's gonna probably do just great. Almost can grow on spit. Now, we are at 11 o'clock. Now, it's time for a break. And when we come back, we will go on to more small plants. Uh, let's see, it is, 10.58, let's come back at 11.05. And again, if you have questions, please add them to the chat or let me know in some other way. Okay, we're back. It's 11.05 and we have a few more things to cover and then we'll have a short period of time afterwards for questions and answers too. So there's a couple of plants on this list or there's actually three, but um, I want to direct your attention first to rock rose. Rock rose is a native and it only grows in the two varieties that you see here. And rock rose will grow very well in very, very poor soil. It is not a very large plant. It's only going to grow about a foot tall, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> about a foot tall and maybe a couple of feet wide but it is a really good plant um, to fill in. And it is lovely to boot. Hold on one second. Sorry, I had a little cough there. I was having a little snap or a break. Um, another plant is Lantana. You see Lantana used everywhere. And Lantana is not native, but it's been here so long, it might as well be native. You see it along freeways. It is a bomb-proof plant. If you are a person who cannot garden at all and you feel like you have a black thumb, Lantana might be a good place to start. And it does come in so many colors. It comes in white, pink, yellow is the most common. It is the hardiest of the virgins. Then it also comes in a lovely multicolored variety so that you'll have a variety of colors on, um, on one bush. If you're filling in, for example, a parkway, that area between the sidewalk and the street, and it might get occasional foot traffic, and you don't want to kill one of your beautiful plants, lantana is a good one to put in there because it'll come back. You can also basically scalp it to the ground and it will come back again. And it needs, when I say almost no water to, to thrive, it's amazing how little water it can survive on, especially considering it is not a native. 
The peony that you see on the bottom left is a native and it has that beautiful flower. It's a lovely, lovely shrub. The flower, the picture really doesn't do it justice. It's a deep, deep maroon red. And it's a spectacularly beautiful plant that will grow up to five feet tall and about five feet wide. So you need to give it room and it's a native. So once it's established, it won't need a lot of extra water, if any, and you don't fertilize it. But it is a beautiful plant that birds and butterflies love, but it's just spectacular in any garden that has that plant color palette. So of course we have more small plants, right? Um, Red Hot Poker is also from Australia. I think it's a wonderful addition to any yard with, with the hot colors in it. A lot of the plants from Australia, actually a lot of plants in nature um, are very hot colors. It is a great cut flower. That plant will look that good for a large part of the year. You do eventually have to cut the blooms back. You have to deadhead it a little bit, but it is a very, very interesting plant. It's going to grow tall, but it's not going to grow wide. So if you're covering something up that is tall and wide, um, like maybe a trash can area where you could do a small planter in front of it, this is a really good plant for that. Uh, when I say tall, I'm gonna say five feet tall, maybe five to six feet tall when it's mature. So it's something that you should really investigate if you really like those hotter colors. And it is unusual too. It adds interest to the yard. Gara to the right is a wonderful plant for a mass planting. It is a small flower. That's why I've zoomed in on it. It's white and pink. It is well liked by um, hummingbirds as well, but it has a beautiful foliage to it. It looks good the majority of the year. It will spread on its own. So you can start with one or two or three small plants, give them space and they will spread. Requires very little water. Again, because it's a native, it requires no fertilization. I, pl I put iris at the, um, I should move that little bar. Hold on, let's see if I can move the little bar a little bit. Um, iris, iris is probably like your grandmother's plant. When you look at iris, you think, oh, my grandmother planted those. But iris have their own place in the yard. Now, this particular iris is not a native. I put it in just because I thought it was pretty. But there are a, there is a native iris called a Douglas iris. It's purple and it's small. But if you're looking for a spectacular, showy, sometimes double blooming plant, iris might be what you're looking for. Also, it's leaf structure at the bottom. Those knife-like leaves can add interest to your yard and the leaves will stay nice all year round in California, in Southern California. There are some that are double bloomers, meaning they bloom in the spring and then they bloom again in the fall. They need very, very little irrigation. They do need fertilization in March. So you would have to give them some fertilizer in March to encourage uh, flower production. The flowers don't live a particularly long time. So they're kind of showy. They're in and then they're out. They're, you might have them for two or three weeks and then again in the fall. But I plant iris for their foliage. I do love the flowers and I cut them and bring them in the house as well. But their foliage is interesting. And because they can grow a very dense fan at the bottom, they can cover up things that I'm trying to hide. At my house, I have a crawl space under my house and there are grates in front of that um, uh, crawl space to keep animals out from under my house, but the grates are ugly. So I have iris planted a little bit off the grates so that they cover up the look of, they cover up the grates, but I have them planted anywhere in my yard that I find difficult to grow other things because they can do without irrigation. They do better with irrigation. They are not a native. They can do without it and they will still bloom and still get larger. The other good thing about iris is that you, um, they propagate on their own. They spread on their own. Iris can be an expensive plant to purchase. If you look at an iris catalog, you'll find one, one iris plant will be 
14 or $15. I would encourage you to look for an Irish society or an Irish club because they'll hold sales a lot and they'll sell them to you for a dollar. And that's what I've done is I've gone to little Irish clubs and bought one for a dollar and planted it. And sure enough, next year I have Iris and I don't buy a lot. I buy, because I have a large landscape, I have to watch what I'm spending. And so I'll buy one, two or three, I've spent under $5. And within a few months, I have a pretty nice looking plant. So don't overlook that old school Iris plant that your grandma probably had. It's well worth it. I think grasses, non-traditional grasses, right? Most of us grow Kentucky bluegrass or fescue in our yards, but non-traditional grasses can add variety to your yard. They can also add beauty to your, your yard and they're very, very easy to maintain. Most of them are clumping and they're warm season grasses and they're low to moderate water. They're not incredibly drought tolerant. They have a variety of water needs. So I'm gonna start with Pink Cloud up at the right top. It truly looks that good as a mature plant. That happens to be a mass planting and it's, <laughs> the plant itself is actually obscured by the, the flowers. They're lovely for movement, any sort of wind and they sway. And I like the pink variety, but there is a purple variety. There is a white variety as well. The pink is the more native and it is the sturdiest. And you're gonna ask yourself, oh, what do I need to do to these? Nothing, nothing. Um, you can plant them and then it's basically set it and forget it for five years. About every five years, you need to give it a butch haircut. That is all you do to it. To me, that is a perfect plan. I have several of the pink clouds blooming. Um, they do need sun, but they can tolerate really too much sun. They can tolerate day long summer beating, but they are a medium water plant need. They can also tolerate drip irrigation, even though they're a native. So if you want to plant them with drought tolerant plants from the Mediterranean, they're going to be fine. They will survive. They won't just die from drip like a California lilac does. Another plant that's in the same family is the deer grass that you see toward the, on the bottom right. It also puts up blooms that are similar to pink cloud, but they are brown. Um, you can cut them out and just live with the grass. But the majority of the year, it's not a prolific bloomer. It will look just like you see. It provides interest in your yard and they will grow in places where nothing else will grow. California fescue, which you see in the middle, is a native grass and it will not get larger than that. It won't, you know, we have to cut our Kentucky bluegrass and our tall fescue periodically to make it look nice. California fes fescue will continue to grow in this lovely habit, right? This lovely mounded habit. And you can just kind of stick it in for interest in different parts. Very drought tolerant, can take a beating from the sun, as can the sedges that you see on the left. That happens to be common sedge or Carex panza. And it, it has a beautiful little bloom um, you can see the little blooms in the picture. They're just tiny and green. They don't look that different from the plant. It will stay, all of these that you see here will stay in a nice compact shape. They will get a little rounder, but they will stay relatively compact and tidy and neat. That's why they look good in a mass planting. The sedges though come in a, such a wide variety of types. My favorite, I couldn't find a good picture of it or I would have put it up and most people don't like it. I'm the only one who likes it. Um, there is a, uh, a variety that puts out a beautiful, sounds crazy, orange brown flower in a corkscrew shape. Um, that's, one of my, that's one of my absolute favorites. But this, the regular typical sedge, Carex Panza, will give you some green throughout your yard year round that needs no fertilization, needs no mowing, 
and needs very, very little water. And, you know, rocks generate heat. You see that it's planted there next to rocks. And I picked that picture on purpose. Rocks just hold on to heat all, all night long in the summer. They're hot. And Carrots Ponza is not bothered by that. Some plants are. They don't want to be next to rocks. They want to cool off at night. Rock rose, which I showed a few pictures back, and these sedges, they don't mind that. They're okay with that extreme hot heat from the rock. That makes it very valuable to fill in in different spots in your yard. I don't know why this is doing that. There we go. I, I, at, at a last minute almost, I decided to add in a few shade plants. I don't have a huge amount of shade in my yard, um, but I have friends who have shade. So I, I uh, scored with them to see, you know, what, what would do well in shade because I realized that some of you are going to have shade and finding a plant that grows in dry shade is really not that easy to do. Um, usually shade plants want a lot of water. That's why they're in the shade, but there are dried shade plants. So another variety of penstemon is the heartleaf penstemon. Now the other penstemons I told you need some shade. This penstemon can grow in total shade. So if you want, if you have a large tree that you want to plant something underneath it, a heart state, a heartleaf penstemon is a good choice. Um, bees will find it though. I don't know why I didn't put the bee marker on there. Bees will find it, as will um, hummingbirds. They'll find it. Cream spray is a lovely large shrub that will do well in the shade. The problem with shade plants is they don't bloom very well. Most plants need a lot of sun to activate their blooming season, but cream spray does not. And it is a beautiful, say, five by five um, shaded plant. Pitcher sage, this is not a really great picture of pitcher sage. You can see the little blue purple flowers if you look real carefully. I was really torn making this presentation. When do I want to use? you know, large pictures of the plant versus up close of what the flower looks like. And I thought this was such a pretty plant that I would go ahead and do that. Sages are prolific growers. This just happens to grow in, this, in the shade. They are such prolific growers that you wanna be careful where you put it because they can take over areas. You don't wanna spend your time digging plants out, right? Nobody wants to do that kind of maintenance. But if you notice, that the leaves are definitely a sage leaf, uh, much like the other ones. They have the beautiful purple flower and they will do, they will do very well in shade. Alum on the left is very similar to coral bells, but it can tolerate very dry shade. That might be very handy for you. Usually when you're planting a tree, you have the drippers out along the root line, or you should. Right? It's not right at the base of the tree. It's out farther where the canopy is. Alum can grow inside that line without getting a lot of supplemental water. You could probably go over and hose it down in the hottest part of the summer once a week and it would be fine. And you don't need to set up supplemental irrigation for it. But it does make a pretty picture to have a lovely tree and then have shade plants terraced underneath it. So I added this in shade in case some of you have shade. These are particularly good growers as my, I don't have hardly any shade as my friends have told me. Oh, succulents. Succulents have been the bane of my existence recently. I just started with succulents. Not all, plant, not all plants that look like cactus or succulents, okay? And not all, Cactus will do here because we actually get too much water. Um, cactus do well, like in Phoenix, where they get two to three inches of water a year. In an average year here, we get 12 to 15, believe it or not. And that is too much for cactus. But it is enough for particular succulents. Succulents I have found to be a tad touchy in growing. And these are the ones that I know will grow. I killed a lot of succulents in the last few years just because I wanted to try them so badly. So hens and chicks, 
will do well here. It's called hens and chicks because it puts off all those little pups underneath it and eventually they can be transplanted. I like succulents for their symmetry. So much of my yard is kind of wild, not wild, but you know, it's not very symmetrical, but I like the symmetry that, that succulents add. Hens and chicks is a really good addition to your yard. They do not do well in the beating sun in the Inland Empire. They're going to need a little bit of shade or they're gonna die, even if you water them. So they cannot take a terrible beating from the summer sun. We tend to think of succulents and cactus as the same, but they are not. Echeveria, I have had uh, varying luck with Echeveria. I love it again for the, for the, um, for the symmetry. And my Echeveria this year put out some spectacular flowers that almost look like they're from the moon. But to me, it is not the flowers, it is the actual plant. Again, they will need some cover from the sun and they will need regular water just like any other plant on your drought tolerant list. They do not seem to do well with no water whatsoever. The bottom left is probably my most interesting plant that I have in the whole thing. This is ammonium. And this is a picture of my daughter's um, house. And she has these growing in a very, very shady area that is very well lit. They are a native. Hers are literally, you can't tell, two feet across. And they have propagated on their own. They propagate in a very odd way. They send off runners that don't even look like they're rooted into the soil, and yet they live. Um, Economium uh, is something I'm going to add to my own yard. I only added it in here because I've watched the ones in my daughter's yard. If you're going to go with succulents, I would advise you that, the, that hens and chicks and ammonium are probably the easiest on this list, which brings us to agave. Agave is native to Mexico. Apparently, it likes living in Mexico because it's a little bit, it can be a little bit difficult to grow here. Agave is very, very slow growing. There is a black tip variety that is very beautiful. It will grow here, and they also put off pups, as you can see in this picture. Um, but not all agaves do grow here. So when you go and source plants, go to the big box stores see what they have growing, see what you have growing. There is a, a couple of nurseries that we'll talk about toward the end, see what they have growing there, and then go from there. Um, agave needs a fair amount of water to get established. After that, it seems to be relatively drought tolerant. There are thornless agaves as well. I would advise you to get those because, goodness, regular agave can really get you. But try hens and chicks. If you're really into succulents, try hens and chicks. That's the one that seems to be the easiest to get started with. Everybody needs ground cover, I decided. You know, I have mulch. Almost, I have mulch everywhere. If I don't have ground cover, I have mulch. Mulch, um, I believe you have some sort of program for mulch in San Bernardino. If you put a good two to three inches of mulch down, it is so worth it. I know it's a lot of work, but it will so be helpful in keeping weeds out and reduce your water needs. So go with mulch whenever you can. But if you want some plant material in there, there are some lovely ground covers that are available. Wood strawberry is one of my favorites and the strawberries are edible and this is a native plant. In the Inland Empire, it's not going to tolerate direct total sun for the whole day. It's not. You need it to have a little bit of shade at least part of the day. It will spread on its own through runners. Um, birds do like it, but I would suggest you get to those strawberries first. They're small, but they're good. It is not the most drought tolerant of plant. However, once it's established, you really don't need to supplementally water it anymore, but it getting established, it's gonna need a little bit of water. Pink knotwood or knotweed is just a beautiful plant. It's almost walkable. Like I wouldn't walk on it because it's too pretty, but because of its flat leaf shape, 
It's almost a walkable plant. It spreads on its own. It is not a native, but it's grown profusely throughout the Inland Empire as a ground cover. You might be tired of mulch and you might wanna go with something like pink, pink not weed. Trailing rosemary can be grown as a ground cover or trailing down, you know, off a, an embankment. The thing I love about rosemary is it's edible, right? You can eat the stems, you can eat the leaf, you can eat the flowers, it's, and it smells good. So trailing rosemary is a plant that you can use and, and also you can be edible and you can use as a ground cover. It is tough as nails. When it's growing as a ground cover, you can't run on it, but you can walk over it a few times without doing too much damage. So if it's an area that you need to be somewhat accessible, you can put trailing rosemary up in its spot. Blue chalk sticks is one that you see throughout the Inland Empire. It's going to spread on its own as well. It will almost always look this good. It is a succulent. It's going to need regular water in the summer and then it can survive on rain during the winter. But it is one I highly recommend for contrast in a yard. And it's it just makes a beautiful hillside or a beautiful fill-in, but it's gonna grow a little bit tall. So pink knotweed is gonna stay pretty flat, maybe two to three inches. Trailing rosemary is gonna grow a little bit tall. Wood strawberry, can't walk on that. It's gonna be a couple inches tall. But blue chalk sticks is going to be about six inches tall. Hold on one second. Excuse me. I've got to close my window. Someone is mowing. I'm right here. But there we go. I think that got most of the noise. That brings us to time. Um, time is a lovely, lovely ground cover. It is most varieties are also edible. It puts out this beautiful white flower. I don't have any plant, vegetable plants in my yard, but you know, herbs are a wonderful thing. You can go out, pick your own herbs and cook with them. So really look into rose, trailing rosemary and thyme as well. That brings us to our last of the ground covers, which is African daisy. It holds a unique part in Southern California in that you can plant it next to a pool. It, the, the salt water from your pool or chlorinated water from your pool really will not bother it. It is almost bomb proof. And it comes in the brightest, most cheerful colors. It comes in orange, red, yellow, um, you name it. It even comes in a beautiful, brilliant pink. So if you, you have it, and, and it does grow by runners also, so it's gonna spread, but it's not, none of the plants actually on this will spread so much that they are a problem. You may need to cut them back a little bit occasionally, but they're not going to become problematic where you have to dig them out and they're hard to use. African daisy is an underutilized plant in residential applications, meaning that it should be used a whole lot more. It's cheerful and it's almost bomb proof. So if you're looking for a lovely ground cover, I would really look at African daisy just buy one small plant, try it, and it'll, it'll spread. You can always pull it out and you won't have lost a lot if you don't care for it. So that's, we've got a few more plants here, but now we need to talk about maintenance and irrigation. Let me check our chat real quick to make sure I don't have any questions in here. Okay, good. All right. Looks like Devin answered the question. Um, Blue-eyed grass on the left is a lovely uh, native. I just added things in as we've gone along, as is, I, I don't know why this is called mountain violet. It is not violet and it doesn't grow in the mountains. It is another lovely ground cover. Um, I would highly recommend if they're within your plant palette colors, certainly look into them. They also in the Inland Empire need a tiny bit of shade. They cannot take a day long, 12 hour beating of sun, but they're remarkably resilient and they spread on their own. So maintenance and irrigation. You, you need to plan for 
what I call exponential growth. Some of these plants, especially the natives, they will, um, in the nursery, I need to put my camera on for this. So in the nursery, they're gonna tell you these plants grow to a certain size, but the reality is they will probably grow much, much larger. So wherever you're gonna put your plants, make sure you give them a lot of space. That is especially true with plants like Cleveland sage or the fried eggplant. They're going to get big unless you wanna spend all your time knocking them back. Don't overplant your yard, no matter what you do, start in a small space. Don't overwhelm yourself. Take a small space that maybe is nothing right now and add plants and mulch to it or remove a small amount of grass and, and redo that area. Don't start in a huge project. You can always add more plants later. Don't add too many in the beginning. Even if it doesn't look full in the very beginning, that's okay because they're gonna grow and you don't wanna be stuck in the position of yanking plants out later. It's a lot of work to do that and sometimes they're very difficult to get out. So plan for exponential growth. Always, you could always add back in later. Look, when you're planting, look for a, what I call a story look or a tiered look. The plants in the back are the biggest, then you maybe have medium-sized plants and then small plants under the medium plants. So it's like stair steps. If you plant less in the beginning, it will make that much easier for you to do. With natives, you're gonna get very occasional bugs. Mostly the birds and ladybugs will take care of those bugs for you. I mentioned using an insecticide in the beginning. Aphids are the worst. They're gonna suck the life right out of your plant. There, is a, there are not enough ladybugs in the world to get the, the um, aphids off my roses. So I use that systemic, but usually you will not get a lot of bug problems when you plant natives. You're only gonna trim these plants when they're basically either diseased or deranged. I haven't had a diseased problem. Deranged I have, where they just have grown too big and I need to reshape them. I'm doing that right now because I was gone for a few weeks and I didn't do any maintenance and now I'm looking back at it. That being said, the maintenance is not that hard. You just need to get a system down. It's not, so if you have grass, you mow it once a week in the summer, you edge it, you trim it, you check your irrigation system. You have a system of maintenance. This is a different system of maintenance, but there's a lot less maintenance than there is with grass, significantly less. Don't fertilize your, nat your native plants. Know which ones are natives and which ones are not. Just don't. If you fertilize them, you're gonna attract pests, you're gonna attract bugs, and you're eventually gonna kill the plant. So resist the temptation to fertilize. Just don't even buy it. Save yourself the money. They just don't need it. They are natives. We're only touching very lightly on irrigation. So in general, native plants don't like drip irrigation. Plants from Australia and the Mediterranean do like irrigation. They're fine. They like drip. They like irrigation. Once you get your natives established, and that means, let, let me give you an example. I planted a couple of natives um, a couple of months ago. I watered them the first day I put them in. I, they needed that. And about the first week afterwards, I would go out and occasionally hose them off. I actually did plant two California lilacs about two months ago. I have since ignored them. I went out yesterday and checked on them, they're fine. You want to plant natives in the fall, if at all possible, because that gives them the winter to ground in. I didn't do that because I couldn't get the plants I wanted in the fall. So now I'm gonna have to watch them a little bit. Because they're young plants, if it gets really hot and they look not good, sometime in August, I'll go back out, here in August, I'll go back out there and maybe hose them off but I won't ever drip them. They don't have drip even hooked up to them. So this is the way you treat natives. Now, next year we'll get some rain, even if it's a drought, hopefully we'll get some rain. That should be enough for them to, be, to survive. Most plants that are native plants, the first year they're gonna be kind of sleepy. Okay, they're not gonna do a whole lot the first year. They're putting in their roots. 
the next year, they're going to really start to move forward. So that's your irrigation. If you've got drought tolerant plants like kangaroo paw, for example, they can tolerate drip. So if you've already got drip irrigation set up, you might want to look at using more Australian plants and more plants from the Mediterranean than natives because natives, again, don't love drip irrigation and why waste your money? Look at some of those, the, the Australian plants. They're beautiful, they're unusual, and you can mix and match them. Don't forget that native plants kind of sleep in the summer and the other plants kind of sleep in the winter. They're not gonna look bad, but they're not gonna be blooming. And that's a change. We like our plants to bloom in spring and summer. They're not gonna do that. Okay. They're going to have their own little sleeping time. There's nothing wrong with the plant. They're just resting and regenerating, just like us. We do it too. All right, let me go to the next slide. So Devin and I have a, okay, before I forget, this is that pastel yarrow that, that I have in my yard. Um, it's lovely. It is a hybrid of, a native, of native yarrow, and it grows quite well. It also has the beautiful ferny leaf and also lets butterflies land on the top of it. And then at the bottom, that's from my yard also, that's giant cinnamon, and it's gonna grow to about four feet tall. It's done remarkably well in my yard. Um, it, it stays in a beautiful clumping habitat. I have yet to really trim it back much. Sometimes when the leaves die back, I'll clean it up a little bit, but it stays in a nice round shape. It doesn't need a lot and all sorts of, uh, hummingbirds love it, but bees love it too. The pensimans bees love. They like to climb right down in that tubular flower and get some pollen. So let's talk a little, let me just check chat real quick. So I wanna make sure I'm not missing somebody's question. Yes, African daisies can do well in part sun, but you will get better blooms in full sun. That being said, in the Inland Empire, you'll probably do just fine with them in part sun. You know, just, they'll be, they'll be fine. They may be a little bit slower to grow, but not much. I would think you'll be just fine. All right, plant sourcing. This is almost um, the, a very, very difficult point. Remember, we are on the cutting edge of moving to a new way to, to look at landscapes. Okay, it's a new type, so we don't have everything in place and it can present a challenge when you plant source. So let's talk about the big box stores. Um, those would be like Home Depot and Lowe's. Nothing against big box stores, I shop them all the time. However, almost all of their nurseries are managed by outside vendors. The employees who work there don't necessarily know about plants. Now my local big box stores have native type plant sections now, and that's good, but you're not gonna get a lot of help from um, the people who work there. They usually only have a very small selection of appropriate plants. If you don't find the plant that you're looking for, don't just buy a substitute. Go home and source the plant that you want. Don't just make do because you're kind of throwing away your money at some point. You're not going to be happy. The plant might not do well. The other problem with big box stores is, and this is not them in particular, the nurseries that supply them, they want those plants to look fantastic when they hit them in the store. And even though they all have plant returns, very few people take advantage of plant returns. So they over fertilize them to make them look great. So this is a problem because if you're not supposed to fertilize native plants, you're actually weakening the plant by fertilizing it, especially if you're over fertilizing it. So you go home, you take your plant, you know, this looks great, I love it. You go home and you plant it and the plant dies. Why? Well, because it's been over fertilized, okay? It probably wants more fertilizer. It's probably been over water it's never gonna make it for you. So you have to be very careful about where you get your plants from. Again, this is nothing against the big box stores, but you, you have to know 
what's what's going on. No one really cares at any level once you give them your money and you take it home. Okay, nobody cares that you're struggling with this plant or that you put your hard-earned money into this plant and you want your yard to look a certain way and it's not going to. So this is something to think about. They're also very, very expensive compared to other sources. So keep this all in mind. Then you have what's called a wholesale plant. It's a plant nursery. They sell to the people who sell to big box stores or independents. They are by far the most economical way to buy your plants. A plant that you pay $15 for at a nursery, or I mean at a big box store or a nursery, you'll pay $3 for at a wholesaler. And this can make a big difference if you're doing a large planting. It doesn't matter if you're only planting four or five plants, but like when I redid my backyard, I brought in a hundred plants at one time. That now it's expensive. So wholesalers, when they grow plants, they have two classifications. They have landscape and retail. So they sell to landscapers and those are landscape quality plants. They are perfectly acceptable to put in your own yard. You don't need a retail quality plant. Landscape plants often have not been over fertilized. So, and they have very, very knowledgeable employees. So how do you get to these wholesalers you say? Well, it's a little bit more problematic, right? You have to set up an account with them. And most of them have account availability. Most of them will deliver. They're only gonna deliver when you buy a lot of plants, but sometimes you can drive to them and pick up small orders. I'll put the name in the chat of one that I know of that will sell to customers, but you, um, you may have to go pick them up because you're not getting a big enough order. But wholesalers are always the cheapest, always the best way to go. Next best is an independent nursery, okay? And I'll put the name of an independent nursery. By the way, I don't make any money from any of these people. I don't have personal relationships with them. I'm just telling you what has worked for me. I don't, they're not like my friends at all. So independent nurseries um, are usually uh, like a good medium choice. And they usually specialize in something, but there are not that many independent nurseries left, which is why I want you to patronize them. They're, they, they're a lot more economical generally than big box stores. Their quality is usually really good, but their employees are smart. So if you go in and you're struggling with something and then you can talk to them and they're going to understand about the plan. So that's something I really think you should look, look into. These are the ways that you source plants. I always recommend that people, if you're doing a large redo in your yard, that you have, um, you hire a landscape designer, not an architect. Architects are too expensive in my opinion, but a landscape designer. Some, I'm not one, by the way. Um, somebody who has been around a long time and can help you get your yard together. Even though it's a little bit more money up front, you're going to end up with a very good plan that you can build on for years to come. That's what you're looking at. Maybe you can only do your plan in the beginning, and it's going to take you four or five years to get because you don't have the money and you're going to pay as you go or whatever reason. You have a plan to work off of you're gonna end up with a much nicer looking yarn. Those designers often have um, access to wholesalers and they can source your plants for you and they actually should source your plants for you. If you come up and say, I want this bizarre plant that only, only this nursery has, they should be able to find it for you at an affordable price. So it's very important to think about that. So um, let me see what I've got next. I mean, maybe, let me check my time. Yeah, we're good. Um, this is a good question and answer period. I'm going to put in. Oh, okay. So my favorite, I know the plant you're talking about. Somebody said, you know, you saw Nana commonly known as dwarf carpet as a lawn substitute ground cover. Yeah, it's a good ground cover. It's pretty water intensive, not as bad as grass. Daimondia is one that I recommend often because it's, I, oops, goodness, why won't it let me tell you? 
Pilimondia is one I recommend. Let's see. It. There we go. Daimondi, I recommend because it's walkable. You know, that's always good. It's walkable. Um, that the nursery that I have used, I'm typing it in again. I don't make any money off this. They're a really good wholesaler. There is a really nice retailer and it's unfortunate, but sometimes you, you have to drive. Um, to get now El Nativo, I just put up, they have a website so you can look, but working with a wholesaler is not the same as working like with Home Depot because you're gonna have to do a little bit of research on your own. Plant Depot in Oceanside is a really nice, small nursery, like family owned nursery. Uh, they have a beautiful, beautiful selection of succulents. If you like succulents, that's a really good place to go. Um, there's also, Hold on, I'm gonna think of a, I'll think of another couple of nurseries. But um, also Las Politas, which was on the first uh, website. That was the website I told you to look at. Las Politas also sells plants and they will, they will mail them to you and their prices are reasonable. Las Politas is by far the best um, knowledge I've seen on a website, like it's excellent. You can get really, you can really learn a lot. They have a wealth of experience and I have myself used them quite a bit. Um, does anybody have any other questions? Did I say I was gonna add one other thing that I have not added? We do have time, we have 10 minutes left, which is almost perfect timing for me. Usually I'm way too late for questions. Hearing none, maybe you're all sleeping. Oh, thank you, Devin. Maybe you're all sleeping. You're like, oh, my goodness, I'm tired. I'm tired of listening to this woman talk. Um, I gave you my email address. Um, as I said, I'm retired now, so I'm traveling a bit. But if you email me, I will get back to you eventually, um, sooner rather than later. Um, if you have a question about a particular plant or just a question in general, I have a little bit more time now that I'm retired. Um, any other questions from anybody on any particular plan? Oh, sure, sure. I'll do it right now. Question was, can I share my email again? It's my last name at outlook.com. I'm going to turn it back over to Devin. And uh, I want to let you know, can these, yes, yes, they can look modern. Yes, um, if you email me, I will certainly give you some looks. The more hedged, the more trimmed, the more modern they're going to look by far. Um, yeah, absolutely, you can look modern. It's almost easier to look modern. Giant pen, giant, I see the question there, giant pensamen, perf, uh, they're better if they get a little bit of shade during the day. My giant pensamen get a lot of sun, but by around four o'clock, the way the sun moves, um, they're in a little bit more shade. They cannot take the Riverside 12 hours, 117 degree heat. They just wilt no matter how much water I give them. I experimented with them quite a bit. So you're probably in San Bernardino where you're gonna get that extreme heat too. Um, in that case, you want to make sure that they're shaded at least part of the time. I, I don't have mine tucked under a tree. It just happens to be that as the sun sets, my, my house diverts the sun from them a little bit. They're a very worthy plant. Very worthy plant. Fantastic plant. If there's no other questions, I'm going to tell you thank you very much. I enjoyed being here today. Um, do take advantage of the rebates. Um, you're very welcome. Do take advantage of the rebates. They are, will really make a difference in the cost of your, of your um, project. Thank you very much. Please email me if you have any other questions and I'm gonna turn it back to Devin. It's up to you, Devin.
Great job, Allison, as always. Thank you so much. And again, um, uh, if you have any additional questions, you can contact Allison. You can contact me. Um, I will be emailing all of you guys with a follow-up email, um, including the information from uh, the beginning of the presentation. And also, just so you know, this portion of the presentation, the plat selection portion, will be posted to the Water Department's YouTube channel. So you can go to YouTube and um, go to San Bernardino Municipal Water Department, find our YouTube channel, and this will be posted within the next week. Um, Edith, I see, can you buy plants as you go and use the rebate in that manner? You absolutely can. So you don't have, to, it's not a one-time deal um, for our rebate programs. Um, you can find the application and the information at www.sbmwd.org forward slash rebates. And you don't have to only participate one time, you can continue to apply and participate until you've hit the maximum amount for that specific rebate that you're applying for. So you can go, you can buy a couple of plants, apply for the rebate, get your reimbursement. And then if you didn't use it all, you can do it over again whenever you're ready. So yeah, you can definitely, you can definitely get paid back mm -hmm. as you go. Are there any other questions on rebate programs, information? Happy to answer that. Um, and again, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. And um, I'll also be emailing you all with information from the beginning presentation and also some links and resources for you to refer to for our rebate programs and also uh, conservation, conservation information that you can find offered by the department. Okay, I don't see any hands up. So I'd like to thank you as well. I really appreciate you guys being here today. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. And um, look, like you said, if you enjoyed this, if you uh, found this to be beneficial to you, please tell your neighbors and friends and let them know about it. And also let them know they can find the information on our YouTube channel and that we will be having another one, hopefully coming up in another few months or so. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for attending. Bye. Bye.